I'm glad you're here because I think the next few weeks in our church are going to be faith building for all of us. Because for the next few weeks, we're going to consider the fact that one man died and was raised again. And because of his death, we have life. And because of his life that he gives us, he is the leader and the Lord of all of our lives. And today we're going to look at what I call the paradox of following Jesus. A paradox is something that's seemingly contradictory on the surface and yet contains truth as you look at it. For instance, the more you seek to be attractive or impressive, the less impressive you will be. How about the more you're afraid to fail, the more likely you will fail. How about the more you learn, the more likely you are to know what you don't know. How about this one? The only constant is change. And so we know that paradoxes, they seem like a contradiction, but in reality, there's truth. And today we're going to look at Jesus' words that seem like a contradiction, but contain truth on how we find and live our lives in him. And we see it in Matthew 16, verse 24. Here's what the Bible says. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. This is Jesus' introductory teaching for the paradox that we're going to dig into today. And he's talking to his closest friends, followers that have been with him some three years. They have witnessed his teaching. They have gone out in his name to do ministry. They have been with him, they've seen him, they've known him. Some of them have, one of them walked on water. Some of them have done things that only Jesus could empower them to do. And now he says to this group, so whoever wants to be my disciple. You see, the disciples that Jesus had gathered around him weren't a club that was a closed group. In fact, Jesus is giving an invitation for everyone to be his disciple. He called them and said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He calls us to believe and then he calls us to follow. He calls all of us to be his disciples. And what that means is that you and I have been called to live our life as followers of Jesus. Because that's what it means to be a disciple. A disciple is anyone who's believed in Jesus for eternal life and is following Jesus with their life. That means that you can be a Christian and not be a disciple because we have seasons where we believe but we don't obey. There are seasons when we believe but we struggle to do what Jesus has called us to do according to his word. And so as we look at becoming a disciple of Jesus, can you imagine how mind-blowing it was to them for him to say, whoever wants to be my disciple... James and John were two very competitive disciples. And I bet that those brothers looked at each other and were like, what do you mean there's going to be more? What do you mean this isn't just about us and our position in the kingdom? What do you mean there's going to be more? And then can you imagine the confusion when he said, if you want to be my disciple, anyone who wants to be my disciple must take up their cross. We see the cross at Easter, and we know the spiritual meaning behind it. We know that the cross is where Jesus was crucified, where he took our sin and our shame. His body was broken so that ours don't have to be. We know what that cross means as we look at it with the lens of history and the perfect lens of scripture. But they didn't know what it meant to take up your cross as a disciple. To them, a cross was simply a, a, a tool of execution by the Roman government. It might be like me saying today, if anyone wants to be a follower of Christ, they must take up their lethal injection, die to themselves, and follow me. See, the cross wasn't a spiritually significant thing for them. Yet, it would have changed their life forever. But not yet. They simply saw Jesus as he taught and were confused. But Jesus made no bones about it. His teaching is clear. You and I, can follow him, you and I can be disciples, but it takes three things for us as followers of Jesus to live consistently 
to show that we're following him. First, he says, we deny ourselves, which means we sacrifice our selfish, sinful desires, our ambitions that are not of him. We sacrifice all the things that aren't of him for him and his kingdom. It means that we take up our cross. And for us, that's a metaphor of taking what comes when you're following Jesus. Because many of us will follow Jesus for the blessings and benefits that come with following Jesus. Believers do that. Disciples follow Jesus even when there's a cost. And he says, take up your cross. Because when you carry your cross, you are showing as you give up your own wants, needs, and desires, as you fight your personal sin struggles and you take up your cross, you are showing that you have not only accepted Christ, but you've accepted what comes with accepting Christ. And disciples learn how to do that. And you can do that. I can do that. Disciples also, Jesus says, they follow him. And what that means is that we're fully committed to the teachings and the lordship of Jesus. If you're a believer in Jesus, he desires for you to be 100% committed to his teaching. Not partially committed, not sometimes committed, not committed if you agree, but wholly committed to his teaching and his way of living because he is your Lord. And as we look at having Jesus as our Lord, think about it. It means, Lord, I'm gonna follow you even if something negative comes. There's a cost to me following you. I'm gonna take up my cross. I'm gonna deny myself because that's the secret, I believe, and we'll see it in just a moment. Denying ourselves is the secret to finding the discipleship life and the life of a disciple that we desire. See, I believe the church, those that are gathered together as believers, want to be disciples of Jesus. I believe that they want to be fully committed. I believe that they want to accept Christ and what comes with it. And the secret is deny yourself, deny, deny, deny. You're like, Mike, I just have to tell you, you could grow a lot bigger church if you would stop all this teaching on denying yourself. You realize that people would rather hear live for yourself. You realize that people would rather hear what you want is what you want, and that's what God wants, so go for it. But you know what, friends? We're not here to build a big church. We are here to build disciples. We are here to build relationships that will build you as a disciple. So even when the teaching of the word of God says, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And why does Jesus teach us that? Keep reading Matthew 16, verse 25. He says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me will find it. Jesus, the perfect master teacher, is teaching us a truth using a paradox. Seems contradictory on its surface. If I want to save my life, I have to lose it? If I try and hold on to my life, then that's how I'll lose it? Seems contradictory on the surface. But it is so true. Somehow, as we deny ourselves, somehow, as we take up our cross, somehow, as we follow Jesus, we find our life in him. And this isn't a life that he holds only for us in heaven, but this is a life that we experience with him every day. Somehow, some way, when we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him, we find our life. I think about Peter. He was a bold excuse maker before the cross and resurrection. Before the cross and Jesus crucified, he was in it like he would deny Jesus even post crucifixion. He was a loudmouth that often spoke before he thought. And yet, after Jesus' resurrection, when Jesus came from death to life, Peter was emboldened and Peter was more consistent. And Peter carried the message of Christ even though it cost him his life. In fact, church tradition says that it cost him his life as he took up his cross, a literal cross. Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't find himself worthy to be crucified right side up. And so as we look at denying ourselves, what we find is that Jesus is where we find our life when we deny ourselves. 
Peter lost his life and found his life in Jesus. And we can too. And this is such a great invitation because we can try and hold on to the life we want and desire. But then we'll lose it. But if we hold on to Jesus and find our life in him, then somehow, some way, this promise is true. Lose your life and you'll find it. Hold on to your life and you'll lose it. I think about some things in our world that if you hold on to them for too long, you lose them. I think about an ice cube. If I were to hold on to an ice cube with all of my might, in a matter of moments, that ice cube would be melted, would drip through my hand, and over time, my hand would be completely dry. No evidence that the ice cube ever even existed. And Jesus says, that's what your life is like. If you try and hold on to your life, your wants, your needs, your desires, unwilling to deny yourself, unwilling to take up your cross, unwilling to follow him as a disciple, you're like one who's holding on to an ice cube that's going to evaporate before your very eyes. And the, the teaching is so life-giving to me. Because that means I don't have to hold on to anything or anyone but Jesus. I don't have to hold on to anything or anyone but the one who came for me and holds on to me securely. In Matthew chapter 10, listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 10, 38 and 39. Whoever, wants, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. But whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. What Jesus is saying here is that your discipleship matters. Your following of him matters. In fact, he says, if you don't do it, you're not worthy of me. And does that make you a little fearful? Does that mean that he's going to forget me when I'm in heaven? No. Does that mean if I don't lose my life for him every day and in every way, then I'm not worthy of being saved and called a Christian? Does that bring fear to you? No, I hope not. Because here's the bottom line. We are all unworthy of Jesus. That's why God's grace to all of us is so good. But he doesn't want us to forget that when you refuse to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him, you need his grace in that moment. Because in that moment, he's inviting you to something more. In those times, he's inviting you to lose your life for his sake so that you find it. And one of the beautiful pictures about taking up your cross is because it shows us what we're holding on to. What you hold on to shows who you are trusting. And Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, and you will find life. When you decide to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him, it's my conviction from the word of God and from my life that it's then that you find the life that you really want. If you have been fighting in your own power for the best marriage and the best parenting relationships and the best life you can have here and now, what Jesus invites you to isn't more of you, isn't the best version of you, but what Jesus invites you to is to take up your cross and to follow him. Don't hold on to a picture that you have built in your mind about what your great good life is. But instead, take up your cross and follow him. Because Jesus says, if you hold on to your life, you will lose your life. But if you let go of your life and take up your cross, then you will find it. Years ago in Southeast Asia, they did something to trap monkeys that I think is instructive for you and me today. They built these monkey traps that were essentially a jar in the ground, and the jar had a wide base and a narrow opening. And in the jar, they would place a nut or place fruits. And the monkey would come and grab that nut or grab that fruit, 
and they could not get the nut or the fruit out because the jar was narrow at the top. You, you know what this is. The secret would be for that monkey to let go of the fruits and nuts in the jar. If they did, they would live free. If they didn't, they would be captured and relocated by the hunters. And friends, the lesson is clear for you and me. We are the monkeys. And we have to let go of the fruits and the nuts to find the life that Jesus has for us. Do you see that picture? If you hold on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for me, you will find it. That's the principle over and over again. The paradox. Lose it to find it. So let's get very practical. What does it mean to die to yourself? If that's the secret to finding and experiencing life change in Jesus, I believe denying yourself is even the secret to dealing with addiction and troubles that come in your world. I believe denying yourself is the secret to every part of your life getting better because this is the Jesus way of living. What does it look like? First, it's intentional. If you're going to die to yourself, you're going to have to build new patterns of living where you constantly remind yourself, my life isn't about me. My life is about Jesus. My life isn't for me. My life is for Jesus. You're going to be building new patterns and new ways of thought. Because dying to self isn't accidental. If you leave here today and you don't begin to put in some new practices or up the practices you're already living, and you say, you know what, I'm sure that in my everyday life, I will just die to myself. You won't. Because living for yourself is what you've been hardwired to do by your sin nature and by the culture in which we live. Dying to self isn't accidental, so it takes intentionality. Dying to self also takes discipline. And this is one of those things that when we die to ourselves, it feels like we're losing, but we're actually winning. When you die to yourself, you feel like you're giving something up that you want, need, desire. So you feel like you've lost. But Jesus says, if you lose it for my sake, then you will find it. Just like when you start a diet or just like when you start a budget. You feel like you've lost something, but you've actually gained something because of your discipline. Dying to self isn't accidental. And dying to self requires work. If you look and say, I'm going to build some new patterns in my life to die to myself, Whatever area you're looking at, I hope it would be the totality of your life. But if you look and say, I'm going to die to myself in this area of my life, what work are you going to put in to deny yourself? What if the biggest problem in your marriage right now is your selfishness? What are you going to do to deny yourself and practice the discipline that you want to live differently? Not selfish, but selfless. It takes work. But dying to self is also worth it. This is one of those compounding things as we live it. As we live denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following Jesus. It multiplies in areas of our life. It compounds. And it is so worth it. Friends, as you look at dying to yourself, what does that mean on a daily basis? It means that you're going to decide to love first. Because that's what Jesus did for us. God demonstrated his love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is what love is. God gave his son for us. So as we die to ourselves, we love others first. It's intentional. It takes discipline. But our life-giving relationships are fed on love. So even when you don't feel loving, even when you don't feel you do, because you've decided to deny yourself. You've decided to take up your cross and to live a disciplined life and to follow Jesus, and Jesus loves first. The second thing that as we look at dying to ourselves as I think about how we live, we forgive first. We keep no record of wrongs. In fact, we race to see how fast we can forgive because we know how fully we have been forgiven. 
When you are dying to yourself, you take up less offense because you know the offense that's been taken up for you. When you're denying yourself, you don't hold on to grudges. You don't hold on to the troubles that others have caused. You release those and you forgive first. When you deny yourself, you put others before yourself. And this is so difficult, especially if you're in an age and life stage where you have preteens and teenagers. Because right now, if you have preteens and teenagers, you are putting them above yourself all the time. And it is so hard for you to look and say, hey, I'm doing everything my kids need. So I also need to do what my boss needs. And I also need to do what my wife needs and my family needs. I need to continue to put other people before myself. You know what it's like to put others before yourself. I remember when my girls were in that age and life stage and they were on a competitive dance team. We put them before ourselves over and over again because we would go to competitions that were two days long and the girls danced for a total of three minutes and 48 seconds over those two days. And the rest of those two days were watching other, kid, other parents' kids dance. And they weren't that good. But why'd you do it? Why'd we do it? Because it's good for them developmentally. It was good for them in their confidence. It was good for them to build relationships. Why did we do it? Because there are times we know it's best to put others first. And I encourage you in your life, if you're dying to yourself and struggling to put others first, to remind yourself, this is what I've been called to do by Jesus. Deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him for their betterment. And then lastly, if we're going to die to ourselves, it means that you and I are going to put Jesus first. And it's really the only way that any of this is possible, to love first, to forgive first, to put others above ourselves, is to put Jesus first. And to say, Lord, I take seriously your call on my life. Lord, I take seriously the fact that you have saved me, that you came from death to life, and you have brought me from death to life, and not my life, but your life. I take that seriously, Lord. So I'm putting you first in my life. See, dying to self, you'll learn this as I have learned it, and many have learned it with me. Dying to self says, I'm not always going to get my way. I'm not always going to be the center of attention. I'm not always going to be the one who gets cared for and looked at, but because I'm denying myself for Christ, I'm okay with that. I am finding my life by losing it. And this requires intentional action on our part. It doesn't happen accidentally. It doesn't happen without work. But it is oh so worth it. Let me share with you one more verse today that describes the life you now live because you have been moved from death to life in Jesus. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you want to know what a fully devoted life looks like, someone who's denied themselves, taken up their cross and following Jesus, you look at the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus, this is your reality. You have been crucified with Christ I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the life you now live, you don't live on your own. This is your reality. You've been crucified and Christ lives in you. And because of that, you live your life by faith. Living with Jesus as the Lord of your life. Because you put your faith in him and you know his ways are best for you. I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. The life I now live, it's crazy. Paul says, I'm dead, but I'm alive. I've been brought from death to life. The life I now live, I live by faith 
and the one who loved me and gave himself for me. I now live my life for the one who died and was raised again because that's what he's done for me and in me. So my challenge to you, church, if you want to live for Jesus, church, do you want to live for Jesus? If you want to live for Jesus, then you've got to stop living for yourself. If you want to live for Jesus, then you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. And follow him. If you want to live for Jesus, every day you wake up and you say, Lord, it's not about me, it's about you, I'm denying myself. Or every day, if I follow you and blessings or troubles come, I'll accept it because I've accepted you. Every day, you say, I'm following you today, Lord. Open doors for me so I can share the gospel. I'm following you, Lord. Open doors so I can share your love and grace and mercy. Open doors so I can forgive people first. Open doors so I can live what I know I believe. If you want to live for Jesus, you've got to stop living for yourself. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the chance for and this opportunity to learn and grow from your word. God, we thank you for the chance to draw together and be with you today. Your spirit residing in every believer. God, we thank you for how you lead and convict and grow and challenge us. And God, I pray that you would Lead us to not live for ourselves, but to live for the one who died and was raised again, Jesus. God, I pray you would lead us not to live for ourselves, but you'd live, lead us to live for the one whose name is above all names. Lord, I pray that you would lead us not to live for ourselves, but for the one who brought us from death to life. That's Jesus. Church, is there an area where you need to pray right now and commit yourself to denying yourself? Is there a commitment you need to keep, a sin you need to confess? You should take up your cross. Lord, I've accepted you and I accept what comes with accepting you. Is there a prayer you need to pray that says, Lord, I've been disobeying instead of following. Lord, I've been delaying instead of following. Lord, I've been denying instead of following. So God, lead me to follow. And God, I pray that as the church does business with you, that you would lead us to all be disciples. Lord, may we all have a great confidence that we believed in you, and may we know that we have given our lives to you in a way that we follow you as the leader and the Lord of everything. As the church prays, if you're gathered with us today and you've never put your faith in Jesus, I invite you to make today your day. The Bible says that we are all sinners in need of a savior and that God created this world perfectly and he loves us. But our sin separates us from God and has broken our world. But because God loves first and loves us so much, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and three days later he was raised again from the dead. Jesus gave his life and invites us to believe in him as the only solution for our sin problem. And the Bible says that when we believe in Jesus, when we put our faith in him, then we are adopted as sons and daughters our sins are forgiven, heaven becomes our eternal home, and we are made new creations in Christ to become more like him through all of our life as we pursue him and share him with others. So if you're gathered with us online or on campus and you've never believed yet, but you hear what Jesus did for you today and you say, I believe that. I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus came for me and died for me. I believe that Jesus was raised again from the dead. I believe that I'm a new creation because of my faith. If today's your day to believe, let's mark this moment of your belief with a prayer that you can pray so that you never forget. Jesus, I believe. 
I believe that I'm a sinner who needs a savior and that you are the savior of the world. Thank you for coming for me, for dying in my place and being raised again from the dead. Today, I believe. Thank you for giving me life. As we pray, if today was your day to believe, I encourage you to let somebody know. Tell the friend that brought you, use a response card in front of you. Stop by the information center at your location and pick up a new believer's kit. We have a Bible and some other resources to help you get growing in your walk with Christ. Father, as we pray in this moment and we respond to you, may you be pleased in all of our response. Our response of obedience, our response of worship, our response of giving. Lord, may you be pleased with every single response. We pray in Jesus' name.